Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to this discussion of the Chicoli Tarot. This video was requested by my Unicorn fan members. I have been really gushing about this deck a lot and I, I don't even know where to begin. This is definitely one of those tarot decks that I feel like First of all, I would not recommend it for beginners. I've got so many thoughts. I have so many thoughts. And this isn't a first impressions by any stretch. I've been working with this deck a lot, a lot. In fact, I've worked for it for about half the month of uh, June. And you'll probably have already heard me babble about this uh, in my June show and tell. But um, I just wanted to go through the cards one by one with you and talk through some of my feelings and also just talk through in general how I feel about this deck. You may not have even seen my, my June show and tell, but... I have so many feelings. This is a deck that whenever I saw it online and I saw people talking about it, I, and we are going to be going through the cards. I just, I feel like I need to visualize as I'm talking or, you know, make sure you have visuals. When I saw this on people's videos, I was always confused. I didn't get it. I didn't get the artwork. I didn't get, and I didn't spend that much time trying, to be honest. I was just like, oh, I don't get it. I don't get how that's a Knight of Wands. I don't get how that's a whatever. And I just didn't give it any thought. I did not spend any time really sitting with the artwork and looking at it or anything like that. I just had this snap decision. And I, I wonder if part of that is because I've heard of a lot of creators who have chopped this deck down, taken the borders off. No, no problem with that. I think it would be beautiful borderless. But and have restructured it, right? I know that Don Michelle restructured it and I know other other uh, content creators I've seen have also restructured it or have used it like an oracle because they, they too found that the it didn't seem to line up with the meanings. And so I just kind of assumed that I was going to have the same experience and I actually purchased the deck assuming that I would probably trim it and maybe use it like an oracle and that's if I could use it at all. I just, I went in really dubious, much like I actually went into my relationship with the Deviant Moon. And I suppose in that way, I shouldn't have been surprised when I had a completely mind-blowing experience with this deck and with this artwork. Um, gosh, I don't even know where to start. Um, okay, actually, I do know where to start. When I first got this deck, the first thing that I did was, I was like, okay, let's see what all the fuss is about. And I started looking through the cards. And I was like, okay, I kind of get this one. Sure, sure. Yeah, okay, I guess maybe I can kind of, yeah, I can see that as a magician and I had a reason. I, I can't, actually, I can't even try to mimic it because I, I have had, I can't go back to that place anymore because I see so much now. But uh, in any case, I went through all of the cards and the first time I hit a stumbling block, which was in the first few cards, I can't remember which one, I went to the little white book and I opened it up and I saw that the little white book has been, where did I see this at? Where did I see it? Oh, maybe in the back? Yeah, The Little White Book is written by Lunea Weatherstone, who is the author behind the Forest of Enchantment Tarot. And I was like, well, I never knew that. That's interesting. <laughs> so, so then I go and let's just start with The Fool. So you can maybe have some kind of a similar experience that I had. Um, this is, by the way, a mass market deck, it's Low Scarabeo, it's classic Low Scarabeo, super flexible cardstock, little thinner than a standard tarot. Okay, with all that out of the way, because we don't care, it's boring details, who cares? Um, listen to this, this is our fool, and it shows this like sort of toy-like figure on this, on this like rolling drum toy kind of situation, and here's what it says. March to the beat of your own drum. No one can guide you better than your, your own heart. Key concepts, individuality, beginnings, and soul progress. And I was like, now wait a second, that makes perfect sense. So then I went to the next card. And before looking at the book, I was like, this is really cool because I like the idea that the, the magician here is masked um, or has a mask that they can wear. It really speaks to the manipulative energy that I feel like can often be present with the magician card. So I flip the page and I read what Linnea has written. All the power you need is within you. Seize your own magic and use your will to make changes in your world. Key concepts, intention, willpower, and transformation. And I see here that our, creature, our, our magician is actually becoming, she has this mask that she held up, right? But she's becoming this creature. She's grown the ears. Her legs have transformed her, her tail. She's becoming the beast that she wants to become in this artwork. And now I was captivated, right? And so I went through the entire deck just reading the guide, this little white book. It doesn't seem like it would be that big of a deal, but it is. Lunea has skillfully connected these arts, these arts, these artworks, these paintings to the meaning of the tarot in a really, in just a sentence or two, which I think is astounding. I mean, it's one thing to uh, take a curated art deck such as this one and write a full book, you know, big pages, paragraphs of what each card means and how it connects to the tarot. But to effectively do that in a couple of sentences is 
impressive to me, like really, really impressive to me. And so then I, I took a step away from the book, knowing that I had this there, I took a step away. So I read the whole thing through. I went through every single card. And then I started to, then I, then I went through every single card again. And this time I went through it all by myself. And I was like, what do I see in every single image? Now I've already read the little white book. So I know I'm influenced by this, but the fool and marching to the beat of your own drum, follow, letting your heart lead, because that's how you have to propel yourself forward. It's almost chariot like, and yet it makes sense for the fool as well, because the fool is leading with his heart. He is marching to the beat of his own drum. This magician card, again, I had already gotten an intuitive grasp of it, right? And so I go on and I'm like, the high priestess, yes, of course. She's got this perspective of being high up. She's connected to the earth. She's connected to the sky. She's in that liminal space. And what's free here is her mind, her intuition, her heart, but her she can't physically move to, to change her world. She has to use her intuition. She has to use the powers of the mind, all this kind of thing. And I just found myself just feeling as I went through card by card, feeling really intuitively connected to the artwork in ways that I don't think I can still fully articulate. In our Empress card, we have this idea that she's caring for all these little bugs, all these little creatures that are coming to her, perhaps for aid or assistance. Maybe they're telling her their troubles, right? Um, and then I, again, after I'd gone through the entire deck and done this process, I then looked up Nicoletta Giacoli and I, I looked up everything I could find. I looked up interviews of Nicoletta. I looked up uh, videos, uh, flip throughs of her art books. I looked up, um, there's a wonderful video, which I will link down below. If I forget, please remind me in the comments. Uh, there's a, an incredible video by Veronica Jude where she goes through this deck. She has several of Nicoletta Giacoli's art books. I would love all of them. Um, I, I mean, that's something I'm going to talk about in a moment, but and she goes through this deck and she talks about the names of some of the original paintings and, and how she feels they're connected. And it, it's, a, it's an incredible video. So I will link it down below so you can deep dive into this too. But I watched that like twice. I started looking, I looked at Nicoletta Ciccoli's website. I looked at all of her art prints and every single piece of her artwork that I've looked at has spoken to me in, in precisely the same way, just very powerfully. It's as if there's something about this art, artist and her artwork that I just on some intrinsic level, I just, I understand it. Or at least I feel like I have an understanding of it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so, I wouldn't have so much humor, hubris as to think I completely understand her intention behind every piece. That's not what I mean. But I feel like I understand what it's telling me, if that makes sense. And so while this little white book is helpful and I've used it, after the first few days with this deck, I abandoned it. Not because it's not incredible, because it is. And I'll keep it with the deck forever because it's, it's wonderful. But because every single one of these pieces of artwork, I feel like I can truly sink into here in the higher, I mean, this is such a great Hierophant card. And I have never, ever had this relationship with, an, with a curated art deck. And I've even been pretty vocal, I feel like, on the channel about curated art and how in a curated art deck, you have this problem of the fact that the art has been applied to the tarot meanings after the fact. And how could that possibly work? And yet in this deck, for me, it really, really does. But also, I think that's because I'm obsessed with Nicoletta Ciccoli's artwork. Um, there's something about it that to me speaks to the wounded child. It speaks to empowerment and re-empowerment and reclamation of power in a really, really um, astounding way. The lover's card here is this soul figure and she's having her own experience there. I just, and every time I pull these cards in combination or on their own, um, I love this chariot card. I love the way that she's nurturing this, again, this almost maybe this small wounded part of herself as she moves forward in her life. I... I don't have a problem with a single matchup. I don't feel like I would move these cards around at all. And almost, I almost don't even need their tarot associations, but I appreciate their tarot associations. Here we have, um, now I can't remember if eight actually is strength or justice. So we're just gonna double check. Yeah, this one is justice, I thought so. So eight is justice and we have this stack of cards and it's like, oh, that'd be a great like tower card. But it's also to me a great justice card. To me, it speaks to the idea of um, those fine adjustments. Um, it's almost Thothish in a way. In Thoth, the, um, justice is adjustment. And it's these like minute things you do to keep everything in balance so that nothing falls apart, right? And for that, you need equal consequence for action, right? So there's there's a subtlety to the way that this makes sense to me. And again, that's without without referring to Linnea's, guide, Linnea's guidebook. Um, so much about this artwork speaks to me. And I, I want to be able to articulate it better. 
Uh, but I struggle, right? Like, because every time I look at one of these pieces in context with the card that it is, I get a little something different. Like here I see a smaller creature and a larger creature. This is the hermit card. And I get the idea that this larger one has more wisdom. She's been around this wheel more times. She has the light that she can shine to help this little one out. But there's, I might look at it completely differently next time. Um, the precariousness of the wheel here and fortune and luck and how um, we're at like sort of fate's mercy really speaks to me in this artwork. The, this strength card, and I, I mean, I'm contradicting everything I've ever said about the strength card, but I used to have, I, I, every other strength card I've ever seen that has, has re result, resulted in overpowering of another creature, um, in a ferocious way or in a aggressive way, I have disliked until now. And this one I completely understand because it's almost as though it was necessary, as if this was a part of herself that, that she, you can see that to me it's like they're connected right they're not it's an overlap in the artwork but the back foot of this creature almost looks like it's bleeding into the tail of this one and this is how so many of us sort of instinctively respond to our shadow or to the part of ourselves that we're, we're having difficulty with instead of meeting it with compassion we tend to try to overpower it to to um dominate it and that's what we see happening here it doesn't mean it's the right action and so my advice would be like this is this is not how you want to handle this but it makes sense to me that it's here, that it's on this image, particularly in the context of this deck. The perspective of the hanged man in this card makes so much sense. Of course, they are hanging, but we have this two-headed creature. So, of course, they're going to have slightly different perspectives on their experience, even though they're in the same place at the same time. The third, this is just super Snow White here in the death card with the seven dwarves and the poison apple. Um, so that's got a very fairy tale-ish fairy tale vibe. But this temperance card, the, the fact that she is resting here in the space between, in, in a liminal space in a way, right? She's on a fish, which theoretically shouldn't be in the sky, but she's in the sky. There's this duality and otherworldliness to this artwork. And I just, I get it. Every single piece, the devil card, the tower, how she's built this up and she feels like she's got it all under control, but it's all going to come crashing down. I... I can't defend the fact that this is a curated art deck, besides to say that when I use it in practice, it is incredibly powerful. Um, it ended up being highly requested in my Unicorn Fam member readings. And I think that's why the Unicorn Fam was like, do a walkthrough of this deck. Because I, I just, every time I pull a card, it's like I just, I get, I can have an entire conversation. Here we have the sun card and it's these bees being drawn to her where she is the hive. I love the fact that the judgment card shows our central figure here at the center of a labyrinth and the way that that can represent an awakening or new knowledge. The idea of going on that sort of transformative journey is here. The fact that the world is contained in a snow globe here is excellent to me because I often do look to the world card to discuss the concept of boundaries, um, the association with Saturn and all of that. This really works, but also that feeling like that this part of the journey is at an end, right? We've we finished it. This, this chapter is closed. We can have a memory of it, but it's time to move on to a new journey now. Um, and then we go on to the suits. So we have the Ace of Wands where she's literally clutching. And there's so much, oh my gosh, there's so much cleverness. So let's just talk about, I'm going to not do this in the traditional way. So those are the majors and I've kind of babbled my way through them. Now let's just break apart into the suits for a second and talk about that because I have feelings. I have feelings. So there's our wands. Let's move the guidebook out of the way a little bit. Here are our cups. Nope. Like, this isn't right. Our swords. And our pentacles. Okay. So in the aces, we have something being held very close. And we're sort of um, bonded in a way. We've, we've absorbed almost in a way the element. So in the Ace of Fire, she's like hugging the salamander close to her as if she could absorb it into her body, right? In the Ace of Cups, the suit of emotion, she's got a, a whole pile of her, right? A whole pile of herself in this tiny little doll form that she's also clutching close to her. And then of course the cup suit, we're looking at emotions and our relationship with ourselves and our emotions. In the Ace of Swords, she's clutching this, um, lollipop that doesn't look very happy and she's literally eating it and there's this idea of like thinking you have an idea or thinking you know it all or thinking you have this information and just like 
rolling with it that I don't know, it's hard to describe. The ace of pentacles or the ace of the earthly suit, she's got these butterflies and she looks as though she's been absorbing the earth, right? That she's become one in a way with the element. So it's there, it's there if you're looking for it. And the rest of these, we're not gonna see the same kind of thing, but you do see, if you're looking for it, you can see the Rider Waite Smith, right? It's not that much of a stretch. Here in the two of, so, excuse me, the two of wands, we see that looking at self or these two figures, so oftentimes in the two of wands, we'll have this idea of a meeting of two, right? A connection between two, but more of an enterprising kind of thing. This to me speaks to the idea of like, you don't need another, you can do this on your own, you've got everything it takes. So like believe in yourself kind of energy almost. The two of cups, the two of the water suit, again, we're getting this feeling of self-love and like our relationship with self-love through this suit as we sort of meet ourselves. In the Two of Swords, she's balancing between these two options, right? Like this building or this building, right? She's walking this precarious tightrope, trying to figure out which way to go. In this case, it looks like she's headed this direction, but she could pivot and go the other way, or she could let go and just fall down to the bottom, right? So this, this uh, tight wire really makes sense to me for the Two of Swords. And then in the Two of Pentacles, we have this juggling, and everything that she's juggling is like a physical material thing. It even looks like food, right? So or food or toys. So it's very material. And here we have our threes. <clears throat> so we have our three of wands. And the idea is that she's gone on this journey. She's well on her way, but there's dangers along the way that she's encountering. In the three of cups, we have that joyful celebratory play energy happening. In the three of swords, she's been literally pinned to a board. She's got a tear rolling down her cheek. And there's this feeling of like, maybe she trusted somebody and she shouldn't have, and she's gotten hurt. She's learning her lesson the hard way, right? And that's my main theory for the, or I guess association with the Three of Swords is learning the lesson the hard way. We're expanding and we're growing and we're learning, but we have to experience pain in the process. And then we have the Three of Pentacles, this collaborative situation. And this is a very Alice in Wonderland moment where she's getting help from this other figure to eat the mushroom to get to the right size. There's again, that Alice vibe, right? In the fours, right? We have in the Four of Wands, we still have this moment where we've made progress on our journey, but we've still got so far to go. So we might feel like there's a moment to pause, but she's still running full tilt, so there's more to do. In the Four of Cups, there's an isolation to being in the bubble. Sure, she's content and safe, but she's cut herself off from these other experiences. In the Four of Swords, there's, yeah, there's respite, but there's all this chaos going on around her. So she's getting a break from it, but is she truly resting? Maybe not. So sometimes I feel like it speaks to the shadow of it and sometimes maybe not so much. Here in the four of, you know, maybe it's more of the positive side. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm getting very excited. So I'm using a lot of words. I'm sorry if this is obnoxious to watch, but this deck excites me. The four of coins here, uh, we often see that idea of like locking ourselves away and holding onto our resources really tightly. Here she's isolated herself very thoroughly. She thinks she has it all. Nobody can take what she has. She's unreachable, but she's also unreachable. Here we're into the fives and the fives are not easy, right? And this deck does go to some dark places, don't get me wrong. So in the five of wands, <clears throat> it's almost as though this creature was coming at her for something it wanted from her. And she's like, you know what? Just freaking take it, here you go. But it's gonna be my decision. It feels very empowered. Like she's like not gonna play this, this creature's game. In the five of cups, there's this feeling of, of sadness and like needing to feel held and wrapped up in comfort. Um, so that, that kind of wallowing energy that the five of cups can, can take and the way that it can become addictive, you can almost become bonded to your grief and you can become a part of it. It can become a part of you. The maybe not getting a breather when you need it, maybe not turning around to see what you still have, but rather sort of identifying or over identifying with the sadness of your story. In the Five of Swords, we have clearly, she's gone overboard, right? And she's about to hack this poor turnip or carrot or whatever it is. Um, so you get that bully energy happening. And then in the Five of Pentacles, there's this sort of sweet, sad isolation. The fact that, you know, she feels probably very lonely, but she's surrounded by little loved ones everywhere. Here we have the Sixes. In the wands, um, we're seeing this idea of kind of coming back. It looks like there's a some kind of altercation or something that's happened, but we still have the sort of victorious writer. She doesn't look all that victorious. You almost get the feeling like the shadow of this is that perhaps she's had to sacrifice something along the way to get that recognition. Like perhaps, yeah, she got it, but what did she lose in the process? Which is really interesting as a perspective. In the Six of Cups, this 
wistfulness for something sweet and something innocent and the sort of reconnecting with perhaps a creature or an old imaginary friend from childhood is kind of what this makes me think of in this particular moment. The Six of Swords is very classic. This creature is being, this girl here is being ferried across this, obviously the whole toy area here has filled up with water and this she looks as though she's not well and this fairy person is a bunny who is crying as he ferries her like it's not easy to be in a six of swords moment we're still process we're still processing we're still grieving we're still going through the process of whatever has happened to us in the five but we are moving away we do have help um so yeah but you can still see the wreckage all around right it does it acknowledges the difficulty and then in the Six of Pentacles, a card in which we're normally seeing that we have so much we can share. Here she has quite a few mice friends, and yet she's kind of looking sort of suspiciously around. It's like, wait a minute, you have more mice friends than you need. Share some mice friends. I don't know, maybe that's a stretch. Um, that's what I'm getting in this moment, but I'm also not using it for a reading in this moment. When I use it for a reading, it's like it all just hits, right? Uh, there is this sort of sinister dark quality to this artwork, despite the fact that it features this like these like almost sweet looking girls. There's all this darkness and shadow in this deck, which is super interesting to explore if you feel comfortable. I could see for some people this being a very, very triggering deck. Um, it has not for me at all. It's been very empowering. And I'll talk about that more when we get to the kings, but there's a lot here that I think is, is really potent. In any case, in the Seven of Wands, we're seeing this idea that we're definitely up against something that feels bigger and stronger than we are. And how are we going to respond to that? Are we just going to let that happen or are we gonna stand up for ourselves? In the Seven of Cups, this idea of which rabbit hole am I gonna get, go down is kind of partly what I think. And then also it's like, which rabbit am I gonna try to grab? You know, it's this chaos feeling of like all these options around us. In the Seven of Swords, you know, being blissfully unaware that there's a little sneaky sneak happening over here in this corner, right? Are we being aware of what everyone's motivations, true motivations are, or are we being a little naive in this moment? And then in the Seven of Pentacles, this moment of like patience and waiting for right timing, we have this sort of spider girl who's cast her webs and is just simply waiting and trying to be patient for the reward. It really, it works so much more than I ever imagined it, it, was, it was possible for it to work. Here's our eights. In the Eight of Wands, this idea almost of like little lightning bugs that she's about to release to fly off and perhaps take the message where she needs it to go or to manifest her desires or whatever it might be, but there's this potential here. In the Eight of Cups, we have this feeling of the caged bird and like freeing ourselves from that feeling of being caged, making the decision that we don't have to be that anymore, that we might on the surface look like we have everything, but there's this hollowness that we need to address. And... We need to free ourselves. In the Eight of Swords, it feels like this giving in, in a way, to feeling stuck in a situation, get feeling powerless, even though there's actually nothing hemming her in. There's nothing visibly that we can see on the card that has trapped this girl. And then in the Eight of Pentacles, where we have this mastery of work, we see refinement and um, perfect, perfecting what we can do. Here we have a creature who is taming, rather, excuse me, training another creature. And we see all the evidence that there's a lot of training activities that have been going on. So it's the rep repetition of work. The writer Waite Smith is here. It's here in plain sight. Well, maybe it's not plain sight. Maybe it's plain sight to me. I don't know, but I love it. Here's our nines. In the nine of wands, we get this feeling of being guarded and protecting ourselves. So we're protecting our space. There is a danger right behind us, right? So you can take this a number of ways. You can take this as the not so vigilant nine of wands where she's stopped guarding. She stopped being as vigilant as she needs to be and danger has crept up on her. Or you can assume that she has it all in hand and will spin at just the right moment and deal with that. She may be tired, but she knows she can still do what she needs to do. In the Nine of Cups, I mean, this is perfection. She's in a bubble bath with a gingerbread man. Okay, the gingerbread man um, looks content as well. Um, it looks like there's some kind of beautiful, yummy thing being poured into the bath that she seems to like. There's a walking cupcake. I'm thrilled with that. I think that's great. Very content card. I'm good with it. And then we have our Nine of Swords. These girls huddled here as this giant scary bunny is coming around the corner. If you're freaked out by like scary toys, <laughs> this is definitely not the uh, deck for you. In the Nine of Pentacles, she's very content here in her luxury luxurious chair in her, you know, what looks to be a very well put together home with her swan in her lap.
my cards are going everywhere. This deck just really excites me. I'm just, I'm all over the place. So here we have our tens. Tens are intense, over the top kind of energy. And the 10 of wands, we have this situation that's obviously gotten out of control. These fruits and vegetables have gotten bigger and bigger and it looks like it worked at one point, but now it's kind of taken on a life of its own. It's taken over and she's bailing out of there so fast with her little roach friend. She's like, get me out of here. It's gotten out of control. It's more than I can handle. So it's almost the, again, it's the, it's not what we're typically seeing. We typically see somebody pushing through that 10 of wands moment, but we don't always push through. Sometimes we're like, nope, I'm out of here. The 10 of cups, we see this fun, playful area. She's got her little elephant friend. Things are good. She's in a good space. And then in the 10 of swords, she's literally having bites taken out of her by the people around her who have decided that she matters less than what she can offer to them what they can get from her, right? And then it's very exploitative, this card. And then the 10 of pentacles or the 10 of coins, here we have this merry-go-round, this idea of all these creatures, they've got their own like sort of family unit, they're well taken care of, they have what they need and they've got enough so that they also have the freedom to move around, right? They can break free of the, perhaps the, um, the rat race, right? They've earned that position. So now we get into the courts and I really think this deck shines in the courts. I think it's really brilliant, the artworks that were chosen to represent the various, um, court cards. So we have our pages. In the page of wands, we see this creative blooming, this creature that has become the flowers, right? She's at one with her element, but she's standing. She's grounded. So she is earth of her element. So she's earth of fire in this case. And so she's the grounded element of creativity. So she's blooming where she's planted, right? Does that make sense? And then in the page of water, she is rooted in the water. She has befriended her fish friends. She is content and again grounded in the element of water she is rooted in water and then here we have our page of swords same thing she is near she is as near the earth as she can get without being technically feet on the ground but she's still in the air so she's at one with the air but she's grounded she's more um, based uh, in the earthly element earthly part of her suit right and then we have our page of pentacles, our page of the earthly suit. And here she is also blooming and befriending the creatures around her. So you get this idea that she is nurturing and supporting those around her in that earthly way. So she's earth of earth. We, of course, are going to get movement with our knights. And again, also, there's this... this you get the characters of the knights here. Our Knight of Wands is racing through this candy forest, which is so Knight of Wands, right? That adventure. Our Knight of Cups is passionate and like obviously carried away with her emotion, right? It may look angry, but we forget that the realm of emotions is not just love and um, nurturing, but emotions run the gambit. And in this case, there's maybe anger and rage and she's letting it take over. There's this movement with that, with that emotion. There's that, um, being carried away with it, which happens in all of the, uh, all of the suits with their knights. In the Knight of Swords, the Knight of the Air element, we see our figure is riding a paper bird and is again, just like carelessly taking off, doing what she's gonna do without heeding consequence. And that's the case of all of the knights. All the knights to some degree, I think, have a bit of rashness in them with the exception, of course, of our very steady, not going anywhere super fast, Knight of Pentacles, which I think is, is well represented here by this bunny that has one eye missing. They're gonna take their time. They're gonna find the, the um, I, the, the button I, get it sewn back on. We've got the little help me um, candy that has fallen down here. It literally says help me, unless I'm mistaken. No, yeah, I think it says help, or no, maybe it says hate me. Let's check it out. I can't remember if it says help me or hate me. Hopefully we can see that in the viewfinder. I can't see it. Let me bring it up to my actual eyeballs. No, nope, it says hate me. That's so funny. Um, so in this card, right, we have this idea of caution of moving more slowly, but there's more layers you can unpack depending. Again, these weren't illustrated to depict the, the tarot. So I am just letting my intuition work with the artwork um, in this really cool way. Now we have our queens. And again, we get this idea of there's some sort of, of nurturing another or working how we're interacting with another creature in a way in the queens. We see it in the ace, excuse me, in the queen of wands. She's literally holding a little ice cream baby. <laughs> Here, our queen of wands is meeting a little fish friend and having some kind of intuitive conversation with it. 
Our Queen of Swords is having perhaps a difficult conversation with a somebody who doesn't want to listen, this little cake friend here. And here we have our Queen of Coins. I often see her as the nurturer who is going to nurture you in very practical, grounded ways. So I feel like she's the one that's going to make sure you get what you need um, in a tangible way. And so that's what I'm looking for in the artwork. Can I see that? Yeah. Can I explain it? Not, not really. Um, I've done an okay job, actually, considering I'm not doing an active reading with these cards. And I feel like they speak to me the best when I'm reading with them. But actually, let's just see what Lunea says, because I am tripping over myself a little on that one. So Lunea says about the Queen of Coins. Queen of Discs. They call them discs in the suit, by the way. One who gives abundantly of all of life's sweetness, generous and motherly, a resource for wealth. Gives abundantly of all of life's sweetness. So I almost get the feeling like this this ice cream, she may be enjoying it, but she may not be the queen, or perhaps um, the queen is actually the ice cream who's giving of herself so that this girl can have the sweetness that she needs. Interesting, I don't know, but <clears throat> we'll, we would see how it would come up in a reading. But I think my favorite thing, my favorite thing that I discovered was the kings. And when you see them side by side, to me it's abundantly clear what's happening. Um, and I think it's, it's incredible. And that is that in all four of these cards, we see that from the skirts of our heroine in the card, comes the element and the element is being used in an empowering way to reclaim, take back, take um, power, to establish power, to keep power, to somehow move themselves forward. And I think it's really, really cool that it aligns with the elements so perfectly. So in the, in the King of Wands, here's this little dude over here and this queen of wands has unleashed this dragon who is breathing fire on him there's a reclamation of power here it's very a very potent image to me and the same thing seems true here of the queen of of cups who has her her gown is also the sea and she is controlling the sea to ward off this little dude here here our queen of swords seems to be using her words her power of writing and again these we get the idea of the air is coming from under her skirt to ward off this creature in the back and then here and maybe not you wouldn't even have to see it as warding off the creature that's just what i'm seeing in this moment but then our king of co of discs coins pentacles whatever our king of the earthly suit is letting a bull go and again these are so perfectly perfectly aligned with the elements the air and the papers and the writing here the the bull for the disc suit the the waves crashing here for the cup suit and the dragon for the fire suit it couldn't be more perfect and I don't know, this just, it, it just, it completely blows me away, this deck. And I did not expect it to work this well, to function this well in a reading, but it reads very intuitively and very, very powerfully. When I used it for myself, I used it for a couple of weeks. I think I mentioned this already. Sorry if I'm being repetitive. I used it for a couple of weeks. I had an incredible time with it. Um, it is one of these decks that I feel like it just right away speaks to the most intuitive part of me. And I have a few decks that do that, but none that do it quite like this. This is just, it's something. It's certainly something. And I, I just, I can't quite define it, but I would love, um, there's this print that I found by Nicoletta Ciccoli that's, I think one of her more recent ones, she's got it up on her website and it shows a sort of figure made of like what looks like cake or icing or something. And there's a match, a lit match that is another figure that's, it's humanized in a way. But there's this lit match that is bending over to kiss her hand and she's melting away from this kiss. And the title of the print is Just One Kiss. And I freaking love it. It speaks to me on so many levels and I just, I can't even begin to define it. Um, but her work is really, really potent to me. To me, it speaks to, um, I can't, I can't articulate it properly. So of course I had such an incredible experience with the tarot, uh, that just even just flipping through it, that the same day I think I, I got this, the tarot deck in the mail, I went ahead and I, by the way, look at the birdcage fabric I paired with this. Anyways, I right away ordered the Nicoletta Jacoli Oracle deck. Now this one I would say is much more intense. Um, there are some cards in here that I think are even more challenging. There are definitely, there, really, there are some tricky concepts I think explored in this deck, in these, in this artwork in general. But I think it can be powerful if you feel okay looking at it, right? Um, so same thing here, the little Oracle deck was also written by Lunea Weatherstone. Sorry, the, the Oracle Deck Guidebook. Now this is again Los Garabales, so it's in multiple languages, but the first chunk has 
the write-ups. So what I did with this deck, when this deck came in, so it's just artwork uh, with numbers on the cards. There was no titles or keywords or anything because of course this is meant to work for multiple languages. So what I did, is this in order again? No, it's not, okay. I just happened to have the first card on the front. So I'm not gonna be showing it to you in order, but um, what I did is I, I went through much like I did the tarot, I went through and I read all of the card descriptions and went through it once. Then I went through it again and I looked at it and I read the card descriptions and I thought about how what I saw in the artwork matched up or didn't match up with what was written in the guidebook. And again, I think Lunea did an incredible job here, but I matched it myself. And then I made a list of keywords and for each card, I came up with two keywords. And sometimes there's like kind of a light and shadow and sometimes they're both shadowy, sometimes they're both a little more optimistic, but mostly there's sort of one more could spin more positive, one could spin more shadowy keyword. So I made the list and then I went through the deck again and again with my keywords and I, I refined them and I refined them. And then I actually put them on the cards with little sticky notes. Um, I couldn't shuffle them that way. Trust me, even a sticky note will add so much thickness to the cards, it's not doable. But I wanted to go back through just seeing my keywords written on the cards and make sure that they still worked for me. And once I'd gone through all of that process, I used a pink metallic marker to write the keywords <clears throat> on the cards. So let's go through them real quick. Um, but the guidebook little write-ups are also really good. I just wanted some keywords right on the card. I don't know if you'll be able to see them, but here in this card, I have avoidance and denial. All these like bees buzzing around, she's sort of covering her ears. Here I have victory and bloodlust. So she's won against this creature or she's gotten carried away. Again, we have the skirts and something coming out from under the skirts, right? It's a very powerful, I think, message. But here I have sovereignty or hubris. Either she's kind of full of herself and she's, you know, thinks she's got it all figured out or she's actually being empowered, right? Here I have strategy and prudence. Delicious and malicious. So in this case, um, one of the things that Lunea writes about in the guidebook about this card is about gossip and the ways that gossip affects others, right? And so I wrote delicious and malicious because there are times when gossip can feel fairly harmless and can perhaps even be fairly harmless. And then there are times when it's not. And so delicious, kind of like that idea of juicy gossip versus malicious gossip. Plenty versus never enough. Here she's got stuff to share, right? It's very almost six of coinsy. In fact, I think there's a very similar image if I remember in the six of coins. No, it was the rats, that's right. But there was another image. Um, anyway, so this idea of she has, she has plenty and so she's sharing it, but the shadow of that could be that she never feels like she has enough or maybe this creature never feels like it has enough and is constantly demanding more from her. Here we have acceleration or overcorrection. So she's racing through, she's speeding up, very eight of wandsy. Um, <clears throat> or is she overreacting and kind of overcorrecting and going too far? Here we have autopilot or adrift. She looks a little listless here. So she's either kind of on autopilot, which is no big deal. Um, maybe she's just kind of going through the motions or she's lost and adrift. Here this queen's gown has become the chessboard and she's watching the action, but she's not involved in it directly. So I have passivity and abdication. So passivity, she's taking a passive approach because that's what feels appropriate in that moment. Maybe that is the most prudent thing to do in that moment. Or abdication, she's abdicating her power to others rather than taking charge of her own life. Here I have trust and naivete. This reminds me very much of the Page of Cups, right? Um, there's this idea that she's trusting or she could be taking that too far, being naive. I love the swing so much. Um, it's personally meaningful for me. So a lot of these keywords also mean something to me in that way. Here we have rest or escape. She's either just taking a breather, right? Could be healthy or she's escape and escapism, which could be something else entirely. Could also still be healthy, but just to be aware. Here we have adventure versus impulsivity. Here we have support or strings attached. So this idea that she's nurturing another creature or is it that people are always demanding. She's always, other people always expect her to do stuff for them. There's this transactional thing that could be going on here, right? Leadership versus micromanager. She's got this very well-organized domain. So she could be just a really good leader or she could be over the top, micromanaging, controlling. <coughs> Humpty Dumpty has fallen and broken. So I have two concepts that could be explored here. Grief, the sadness of something that's, that's broken and can't be repaired. Um, and, and going through the emotions of just life when that throws that stuff at you. But I've also got irreparable. And here is really, the irreparable is meant to speak more to the concept of 
if you break a dish, you can say you're sorry to the dish, but it doesn't fix the dish, right? And so this concept has been really powerful for personal growth for me. And so I wanted to address that idea as one of the things that could be explored with a card like this. <clears throat> Excuse my clearing of throat. Here we have listen and lesson. So she's listening to this bunny read a story. So she could be just, it could just be about paying attention and really listening, being present, or it could be about there's a lesson to be learned here that you really need to, yes, you still need to listen, but there's more there for you. So neither one of those is particularly shadowy. Here we have improvisation and imperfection. So this idea of um, kind of Im improv to me speaks to making things up as you go along, um, not having a plan, and coming to terms with imperfection, right? So that's kind of what that is all about. And a lot of this, again, was, this is a melding of what I see in the artwork sort of merged with or harmonized in some way with what Lunea wrote in the guidebook. So here we have her kind of blooming in this garden. The, gar the flowers have become houses. And I put plant new seeds or bloom where you are planted. Here we have faith and despair. On one hand, it's faith that he's going to be okay, or he's given himself over to despair. There's a few ways to look at this card. Here we have rescue and interference. Closeness, their, their heart is actually intertwined. So this could represent closeness. I also put codependence. This is a very difficult card. Curiosity and boundaries, both important concepts that are mentioned in the guidebook. Trust your gut and disquiet. She's got a bad feeling, so she's feeling something. that She's experiencing some kind of disquiet. Could be anxiety. Could be that she needs to listen to her gut, right? Could be both. This is interesting. She's giving this bunny medicine, um, and the bunny is crying. So this could be tough love, like you have to take your medicine, or there could be something sinister going on here, right? So toxicity. Observation, she's got this high perspective. She's kind of looking down at something going on, or vigilance. Again, this artwork just speaks to me. Here we have solitude or hiding. So solitude can be good, hiding might not be. Here we have advice or wake up call. Here she's holding a rag to her bleeding chest and she's holding two um, candies that look bloody. Again, this is very difficult. I'm not saying it's not. Um, but here I have compassion. Perhaps she's offering a piece of herself in compassion to somebody else. Or she's being victimized. She's a victim and she's letting people eat away at her and she's not empowered about it. This deck, in my opinion, and just as the tarot, explores some pretty dark spaces. Uh, here we have intimidation versus inner strength, right? Is she standing up for herself or is she being a bully? Kind of like that um, Five of Swords with the sword over the carrot character. Very similar. Here we have guilt and consequences. Um, the idea that something from her past is coming back to check on her, right? So she could be feeling bad and it could be looming over her because of her guilt, or she could be experiencing real consequences for actions. Here, something has come through the door that was not expected. So we have unexpected, so it's something surprising. But also assumptions. Don't assume that this is sinister just because it's not something you're familiar with. And then we have opinions and distractions. Lots of these little birds all around, perhaps just helping, perhaps just pulling her off course, distracting her. There's a lot of action happening. Or it could be that there's a lot of opinions and she needs to quiet them. So that is how I structured the, I keep zooming out too far. <laughs> Let's just do that. It looks so much better when I don't zoom out too far. Um, so that is how I structured the Oracle deck. And I found that putting my own keywords on it and getting to know it in that way really, really helped. And I went ahead and, um, hello, there we go. I went ahead and put this in a matching Peggy bag. So I have my Jacoli Oracle in this birdcage bag here. And I have the Chicoli Tarot uh, with its guidebook in a small bag here. So this is one of Peggy's standards and this is a small, but I just thought, I mean, man, I wish I could easily sum up how I feel about the Chicoli decks, but they are incredibly potent. I do think there is a lot of people for whom this artwork would be difficult, challenging, or triggering perhaps. And so I would definitely advise you that if you're not sure about it, then I, I, you, then spend some time with like walkthroughs. There's something very difficult about this artwork, but there's also something really, really powerful to me about this artwork. I feel in most of the images, this acknowledgement of purity, of innocence, of um, 
but also of power beneath that purity and beneath that innocence. I think sometimes there can be an assumption that what appears small is also powerless or what appears meek is powerless and is not able to defend itself. And I don't think that's true of life or the world. And I think this deck acknowledges that dichotomy that sometimes what seems simple and sweet can be um, very, very powerful. I, I think I identify with that idea. I mean, obviously I identify with it or I wouldn't have such a strong reaction with this, but it really speaks to a part of me that I don't think I've ever seen acknowledged in any kind of artwork ever, um, just that's really spoke directly to that piece. And this artwork does that. There's this combination of, again, the sweet, almost the overly sweet, and overly pure looking, and then the dark and the sinister. And these things kind of go head to head in these in this artwork by Nicoletta Ciccoli, in my opinion, and is done and put together in this really interesting way in these decks. And it just, it's something. It's just something different and something special, in my opinion. But is this the kind of thing that I can just, I think I could just pull out for anything? No. I mean, it definitely goes to some hard hitting places. I used it very successfully in, I, I, in my opinion, anyways, I mean, Unicorn Fam, please feel free to chime in below if I'm, I'm wrong. But I felt like it was very successful in Unicorn Fam member readings when I pulled it out for that purpose. And I have not yet pulled it out for a client reading. I don't know that I would. Um, I think that if I felt a strong intuitive pull to, I might. Um, but this would probably be one of those decks that I only pull out if it's requested by a client. But for my own personal work, for my own personal development, oh my gosh, is this empowering as heck. It really, really is. So I've had an incredible, incredible time getting to know this deck. I'm so excited that it is a part of my deck library and I can't imagine it going anywhere anytime soon. And that's that's for both of them. I think they work beautifully together, but the Chicoli Tarot also works beautifully on its own. I haven't used the Oracle on its own, but again, I've used them together. I've used just the Tarot and just they just blow me out of the water they give very good powerful hard-hitting readings that just I love and they're very very unique in the deck selection that I have available to me so I freaking love them <laughs> so yes thank you to the unicorn fam of course for requesting this video and thank you all so so much for watching as always I'm always giving extra big thank yous out to the unicorn fam they are the supporters of the channel I appreciate you all so so much thank you for your support for all of you who watch who comment who like who subscribe who do all of those youtube -y things that is how you guys are supporting the channel and I appreciate you also it means so much the ways that you interact here in the space again this would be no fun if I was just talking into an echo chamber so thank you so much for being here with me and being a part of this with me thank you for coming with me on this little tour of the Chicoli these are decks both of them that elicit strong reactions I completely understand that as always please keep it constructive in the comments but I do understand this deck these decks are not for a lot of people. And I really didn't think they were for me until I got them. Much, again, like the Deviant Moon Tarot for me. So anyways, I'm going to stop babbling and close this video out because otherwise I'll never shut up because these decks excite the crap out of me. But thank you all so, so much. And may your magic always shine from the inside out. Bye, everybody.